Alright, let's give this a bloody shot, shall we? I'm tired as hell, but I feel like not doing the sensible thing of sleeping, but instead doing some reading. And so I thought I may as well record it. I'm trying to untangle this wire so that I can move across the room with this headset on. How the hell do wires manage to do this? Right. Uh, I will be reading a random extract from Born of the Desert by Malcolm James, which is not his name. His name is Malcolm Playdell. Malcolm James Playdell. And in every other book, they say Playdell. But in this, he says James. So I don't know if that's an anonymity thing, or if everyone else just didn't realise he really went by his middle name. Let's see. When I left off, for context, it was just after a large raid on Benghazi, which went horribly wrong, because it relied on surprise, and everyone and their mother knew when they were going to attack. And, uh... So yeah, this is off. Oh, I should probably mention actually. Uh, I haven't read this before, but, but uh, earlier parts of the book have gone into uh, quite a bit of language, shall we say? This is about a bunch of men in the forties, and well, we didn't have as bad race relations as certain countries, but it wasn't exactly wonderful. Anywho, chapter eighteen. Ah, uh, yeah, my throat is feeling weird. Let's try that again. Chapter 18. Return to Kufra. I'm probably going to mispronounce everything. Yet all experience is an arch where through gleams that untravelled world whose margin fades forever and forever when I move. Ulysses. Tennyson. I'm assuming that's Alfred Lord Tennyson. We dispersed well, taking cover beneath the small pieces of dry scrub. Those who found bushes were fortunate, and making the best of the scanty shade they afforded. I slept deeply for about an hour before the heat of the sun and the curiosity of the flies awakened me to realities. Besides my water bottle, I had brought up a penguin edition of Further Experiences of an Irish RM, but I could not enter into the spirit or humour of the thing and did not find it as absorbing as the family affairs of the... F bloody hell. For oh, Foresights. That's not actually difficult. I'm just unable to read. My train of thought was interrupted too frequently by the drone of aircraft, and every now and then one would be obliged to curl up and try and disappear beneath the sparse camel thorn. It was one of those occasions, as the men would say, when you made a noise like a pebble. I don't know who says that, and I don't know what that means. Pebbles don't make noises. But descriptions of these aircraft have grown wearisome. Sufficient it is to say that throughout the day the enemy were in search of us, sometimes low enough for one to be able to distinguish the pilot's head as a dark ball in the semicircle of the cockpit, sometimes so high that the plane looked as pale as a gull while it circled round steadily, waiting to detect the slightest movement. It was a tedious day. As the sun grew higher in the heavens, the shade from the patchwork of scrub became ineffectual. The heat struck directly down upon us. The hours lingered and crawled past. More our... Yeah, our craft? Aircraft came over. The sun was a little over to the west now. The time should be about two o'clock. It was definitely over now, and still no planes had caught us. They were becoming less frequent and operating singly. The sun began to approach the horizon. The water in our bottles was lukewarm. Shortly before sundown, I walked down to my jeep, collected some medical kit, and made my way over to MacLeod, or MacLeod. I will never know how to pronounce that surname. I'm going to go for MacLeod. He soon lost consciousness under the pen... Yeah, lots of medical names too. He was a doctor. Pentothol. And we had sufficient time to cut away the dead tissues and dress and splint his arm properly. It looked as if both his wounds had been caused by explosive bullets, for they were ragged and destructive. 
As we were dressing him, a bomber flew past to the east of us. In the rosy evening sunlight it looked almost peaceful as it winged its way home. Then MacLeod began to wake up. "'Don't leave me!' he cried. "'Let me come with you! Oh, please don't leave me!' He was weeping hysterical. Yeah, hysterical? Here's... Yeah, theft. I can't read. I'm sorry. He was weeping hysterically, reenacting in his anaesthetic delusions the incidents of the previous evening. Finally, we pacified him and carried him down on a stretcher to his lorry, where we made him comfortable on top of a camouflage net. In the cooler air of the evening, we sat round the cook's three-ton yeah, three lorry, and, with watering mouths, watched our porridge being prepared. I looked round for Paddy Main, but could not see him. It was only then that I discovered that we had split, yeah, split up into two parties during the previous night, each of which was to make... The light is in my eyes, I'm sorry. I can't read like this. <sighs> That's a better light. That should work. <laughs> God, you thought me reading to you would be a good thing. No, it's full of interruptions and things going wrong and me going to wander around the room. Where was I? Each of which was to make its way back to Kufra independently. By so doing, it was reckoned that we were less likely to be detected. Major Barlow was in charge of our convoy, while Paddy was leading the other. David Sterling had remained behind in the Jebel with three jeeps, including a wireless jeep, to make sure that any stragglers not yet accounted for should be picked up. I mean, I don't trust wireless jeeps. Why, why would anyone take a jeep that doesn't have to be plugged in? It seemed strange to be eating again. A small helping of porridge and the hot black tea cheered us up considerably. The cigarettes, too, tasted quite fresh after the heat of the day. But our supplies of them were running short and we had to ration ourselves severely. By the time darkness had fallen, we were ready to move off in our crocodile procession. Mike Sadler was navigating for us. He drove in the leading jeep, using his lights in case of any obstructions or anti-personnel devices on the track. In all probability, he was the best navigator in the Middle East, having worked with the LRDG until quite recently. That's the uh, long-range desert group. They are the ones who realised, hey, that's a desert, we can drive through it, it'll be good. Until quite recently, when he had transferred and been commissioned in the SAS. Certainly he had seen as much action as anyone, and this was merely another job for him. Before the war he had left England to farm in Rhodesia, and it was through him that many of us became familiar with some of the fine men one met at the Rhodesian club. Mike was one of those engaging people, who was clever without showing it, a rare accomplishment, and, with his boyish enthusiasm, he accepted responsibilities as they came, leading us off on this drive, for instance, and looking very much as if it was all part of an interesting game. During the night we covered a good deal of ground, and throughout the next day it was our great pleasure not to sight a single aircraft. On again the following night and day, until the afternoon of September the 18th found us heading back along our own tracks between Jalo and the Sand Sea. Here we were in a quandary, for, according to our plan of action, Jalo should have been captured by the Sudanese Defence Force, yet as we drew near, we could hear the sounds of artillery and occasionally, yeah, occasionally the more shuddering explosions of bomb bursts. Evidently the battle was still in progress, a matter which con concerned us deeply, because we had expected to get our further supplies of petrol from the Sudanese Defence Force. Most of our petrol had been lost during the bombing at the rendezvous, and what remained had only just allow us to, allowed us to come this far. We waited for a while, listening to the thud and boom of cannon and wondering which was the correct portion of the o oasis to approach. Eventually it was decided to send McLean and Sandy Scratchley with two trucks to investigate the situation, and to try and obtain sufficient petrol to get us back the remaining 400 miles to Kufra. I should mention McLean is uh, Fitzroy McLean, and uh, if you're paying attention, various names in this book are ones that I suggested as names for zero. Away they went, and were soon lost to sight. We wheeled in the opposite direction towards some close-growing clusters of vegetation and stunted palms, and here we hid the vehicles, 
ate our solitary meal of the day, and prepared ourselves for a welcome night's rest. The next morning dawned fresh and clear, and we relaxed in languid ease until the gathering heat had made us cast off our blankets. There was nothing for us to do but rest. Each man had his water bottle to, to last the day. There was nothing to eat until sundown, so we might as well lie back and read. By now we had finished our cigarettes. Some of the men tried crushing up the vegetation from the dried palm fronds, rolling it in cigarette paper and smoking it, but the result did not justify the effort. What had happened to McLean and Sandy? Their prolonged absence grew more and more worrying as the hours went by. From the direction of Kufra came the intermittent rumble of battle, and once during the day a plane flew straight over us. The time passed slowly and we began to wonder whether we should have to restrict our food and water more drastically. The wounded were in good heart, except that Mallot uh, there was being pestered by binting ants, which appeared to have been attracted by his stale blood. They were very small in size, and it was almost impossible to rid him of the nuisance. Apart from this, however, there was nothing very outstanding about the day. I wondered how my parents would be spending the time at home, for today was my father's birthday. I tried to imagine what they would be doing by way of a birthday treat. Often they went to the cinema if there was a good picture showing. What were his presents this year, I wondered? Gramophone records? We were always adding to our collection, and by now it must have grown to impressive dimensions. Or so it seemed to me on that hot afternoon as I lay back and stared at the never-ending blueness of the sky, and thought how marvellous it would be if... Just for an hour or two, I was allowed the bitter sweetness of being at home. During the evening, we sent Bill Fraser into Jalo with two more jeeps. It was essential for us to know our exact position so that we could act accordingly. Already, some of the men were beginning to look a bit exhausted, and the uncertainty of waiting was not good for the morale. Judged then our happiness when Bill returned about three hours after darkness had fallen, with the news that he had contacted the SDF, and from them had obtained the necessary petrol which was waiting to be collected. The SDF were withdrawing from their attack during the night, and would be retiring south to Kufra. Sandy Scratchley and McLean were safe, but they had driven into the oasis only to find themselves between the SDF and Italian forces. Consequently, they had had a rather harassing time of it, and their prolonged inactivity was more, of a, mat was more a matter of compulsion than volition. Poor old Sandy... You couldn't help laughing about it afterwards. Well, this news was wonderful. It seemed that our difficulties were over, and Bill, having showered some JLO dates upon us, disappeared once more with a three-ton lorry to collect the, pe the petrol. He returned the next morning with Sandy, and it was decided to continue to hide up throughout the day and make our getaway during the night. Accordingly, we set off just before sundown and drove hard along the flat beacon track which we had used for our northward drive. On again the next morning, average, on again the next morning, averaging between 30 and 40 miles an hour, and with the ground so even that the wounded were not upset by the speed, until at last we had reached... Oh, bloody hell. Berzegan? Zion? I'm going to go for Zegan. Here a well had been sunk by the LRDG, while nearby was a good-sized food dump. I fear we all made pigs of ourselves, drinking just for the pleasure of drinking, and eating until we felt our bellies grow heavy and swollen. The satisfaction of knowing that there was more food and water at hand, and that we could not exhaust our supplies however much we ate, was too wonderful and complete not to be described. I added a word in there. And complete to be described. At Burzegan we linked up with the SDF, whose doctor informed me that they had suffered several casualties during the recent fighting, and that they were waiting here for a day or two in the hope that a plane would come and transport their wounded the remaining distance to Kufra and thence to Cairo. They had, indeed, been wirelessing Kufra frequently on this point, but as yet had received no signal in reply. Am I reading too fast? That might be it. I asked if I could leave my wounded with them, and thus save Mellot and MacLeod the distress of crossing the Sand Sea. Their doctor agreed readily, and in any case, as he pointed out, even if they could not obtain a transport plane, the wounded b would be far more comfortable travelling in the Sudanese hooded lorries 
than in our own open three tonners. They would at least obtain shade and protection from the sun. Accordingly, on the next morning we redressed the patient's wounds, made them comfortable and bade them farewell. Then away over the ridged sand sea once more, with its fierce white glare, its cruel slopes of soft sinking sands, its back-breaking toil and heartaches, away over the desolate undulating wastes until at last we came to the rugged country beyond. Rugged and beautiful, it seemed, as we jogged along steadily in the evening light, for the rocks and hills were tinted with fine pinks and mauves, mauves. We've had a discussion about this. I'm, I'm trying to think, can I make up any other ways to say it? Just so, just for, I can't think of what I was going to say. Let's just continue reading, shall we? Seems the best plan. Which gave way gradually to the softer shades of distance. Surely this was a fitting framework for one of Grimm's fairy stories. And from these barren hills, turned to an icy blueness by the evening light, one could well imagine that some dragon would emerge at any minute. Or might not some huge giant suddenly show his head above these turreted battlements, and with a shake of a nob yeah, knobbly club, emit a roar which would shake the very earth? Yes, it was through such country as this that we... A small weary procession threaded our way, and there was considerable happiness in our hearts when one morning we caught sight of the dirty green of the Kufra oasis, shuddering in the heat haze of the hollow before us. Our convoy was drawn up beside the old Italian fort at the northern edge of the oasis, and we were waiting to go down the road in single file. Home at last, said Shaw, with a cheerful nod of his turbaned head. I turned and watched him as he sat there, with a little smile on his lips, beating out a jazz tune with his fingers on the driving wheel of the jeep. "'Do you remember when you said that last?' I asked. Slowly the smile became a grin, which spread over his face. Then... How the bloody hell is anyone supposed to pronounce that? A-I-E-W-A, -E like... Aiwa! Aiwa! Christ, this is not going to be a fun listening experience. He remarked sagacious, uh, sagaciously, even. But not to worry this time. As it turned out, he was wrong again. For two days after our arrival, we were attacked by eight Heinkels. They came in from the north, flying low over the oasis and strafing the place pretty thoroughly. Their two main objectives were the airfield and the fort. On the former, they destroyed several of our aircraft, while some lives were lost up in the Italian barracks. Crouching down among the palm trees, we never had a clear idea of what was happening. It was very different from the desert, for here our visibility was limited to a hundred yards or so. From time to time the planes would roar over, spraying the palms with machine gun fire. The whole thing lasted only about forty minutes, and I think I am correct in saying the gunner shot down four out of the eight planes. A very creditable performance. We waited anxiously for David Sterling to turn up wondering, as day succeeded day, whatever could have delayed him so long. When someone is late for an appointment, your mind runs riot with the various ideas and possibilities which might account for it, and you tend to oscillate between optimism and extreme pessimism. So it was with us, and one day a rumour circulated through the camp to the effect that David had been captured. Somebody had heard a German broadcast which announced that the daring Colonel Sterling was now a prisoner of war in Germany. Like most rumours, it was impossible to trace it to its origin, and its veracity was disproved soon afterwards by David himself, turning up with his jeeps. Although he had remained in the Jebel for several days after our departure, he had not picked up any stragglers. His party, however, said they had seen an Italian ambulance on its way to our rendezvous to pick up our wounded, so that, at any rate, was a comfort. I have since learned, with deep sorrow, the British party who were left behind at Benghazi died later as a result of their wounds. I can understand why Dawson died. The outlook for Longland, for, yeah, Longland was uncertain. Cox I had expected to recover, while the cause of Wilkinson's death must remain a mystery. Finally, Johnson, the medical order, yeah, orderly who accompanied them, also died some 18 months later, although no reason is known for this. I should mention that's them being captured by the Italians. And it was earlier in the book when he was saying about the Italian reputation for maltreating prisoners of war. 
Oh, which is uh, <laughs> what led on to the line about will British never yeah will British women never learn to distrust the foreigner? Uh, because lots of people were campaigning about um, Italian prisoners of war, saying like, "Oh no, we shouldn't keep them here. We're getting bombed. We should send them out to the country." And lots of people were doing like welfare for Italian prisoners, and all the soldiers are saying, "No, the Italians are horrible to our prisoners. Let's not be nice to them." And that's enough of that tangent. Looking back on it now. One can sum up the results of these September raids. I am afraid they do not make impressive reading. Firstly, our own raid had been a complete failure, owing to the lack of surprise. Evidently the enemy had been informed by agents in Egypt or, and this was less likely, in Kufra. Arab spies, complete with transmitting wireless sets, had been discovered in the oasis. With regard to our losses, I did not find out what the exact figures were, but I doubt if they were high say, 20 or 30 men out of an attacking force of about 100? I mean, you say that's not high, that's 20 to 30 percent. That's not great. The lack of success of our raid was in part offset by the New Zealand patrol of the LRDG, who, with great dash, had raided Bass and destroyed about 25 planes on the airfield. The Rhodesian patrol, who were attacking objectives in the Benghazi area, had suffered the same misfortune as ourselves, while the Tobruk and Matra raids were also failures. One could, of course, say that such and such a gun position was destroyed, or that so many enemy troops were annihilated, but that does not alter the main fact. The raids did not achieve their objectives. The Sudanese Defence Force had found Jalo a more difficult proposition than they had expected, and had been ordered to cool off their attack. Some reports stated that, after a few days of confused fighting, both the SDF and the Italians had withdrawn on the same night, leaving the possession of the, o the oasis to the surprised native inhabitants, but I do not know if there is any truth in this. It's funny, um, another book I was reading made it seem like um, this whole set of raids was part of a distraction um, leading up to the Battle of El Alamein, but um, this book so far, and uh, another one I read, very much just seems like um, there were spies and everyone knew what was going to happen, and it all ended badly, with no redeeming factors. So much, then, for those unhappy days. Yet David Sterling's enthusiasm was by no means damped. He had no harsh criticisms to make. On the contrary, his view was that, since the enemy had known of our raid, None of us could be blamed for what had taken place. The raid simply wasn't on. But now, he continued, looking round at us eagerly, there was an easy target we ought to be getting busy on. The railway line from Tobruk to Alamein. That should make a lovely objective, and there should be no difficulty in blowing it up at more or less regular intervals, and thus restricting its use to a minimum. In addition, David had some fresh ideas concerning the future of the Special Air Service. He wanted it divided into two squadrons which, by relieving one another, could constantly maintain a force in the rear of the enemy. Sooner or later the 8th Army would be attacking from Alamein, and then the two squadrons could leapfrog one another as the enemy's line withdrew. Paddy, now promoted to a major, would be in command of the squadron which would be operating during the next month or two. The railway line would make an ideal target for tip and is that tip and run. The um, printing on this isn't amazing. It very much seems like it would have first been done by um, like placing the letters, like how newspapers used to be done. You'd um, have little metal um, what do you call it? I'm so descriptive for each letter, and then you'd order them in a row, dip them in ink, and then put them on the page. And so some of these are what look like small inch block, um, blotches that make it hard to read the text. And I found um, something earlier that was not a, not a U, but an N that had been printed upside down. I mean, this book is from 1960, first published, I think. 
Uh, da, 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 da. Or is it 1950? I should say. In this, well, this edition was 2015. That's not useful. Um, ba -da -ba. Oh, first published in 1945. God, I didn't realise it was that early. That would certainly explain some things. Anywho, where was I? I should stop going off on tangents. Or maybe I shouldn't. Maybe I should do more tangents. Anyway... Da, 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 da. Ah, yes. The railway line would make an ideal target for tip-and-run raids, and other objectives could easily be signalled from headquarters. I think Paddy was happy to be in charge of a squadron. He picked out fifty of the men he knew best while I, for my part, counted myself fortunate in being able to join in with him. First, however, we should have to refit, that glorious word, and we waited impatiently for the aircraft to arrive at Kufra and fly us back so that we could collect fresh vehicles and stores. These days of waiting seemed very drawn out. There were flies everywhere, and they allowed us no rest. It was simply a case of maintaining a constant fanning movement with the hand. Uh, by night, the mosquitoes and ants pestered us. We had no nets with which to protect ourselves against the former, and each man worked out his own salvation against the latter. I recall that I laid out a rectangle of empty petrol tins for use as a bed. This defeated the ants all right, but each time I turned over it was to a musical clanking accompaniment, whereas the slightest movement produced some sort of metallic response. The only way I could avoid the mosquitoes was by completely covering myself with a blanket, yet the nights were too humid and hot to allow for this. In fact, looking back on it now, it is a bit of a mystery how any of us ever got to sleep. And when we did, it was to the irritating whine of a mosquito which hovered not far away. I just knocked my volume, and that is not good. I can hear myself, and it's loud. Ooh, worrying. Our main relaxate... <laughs> relaxation, bloody hell. Our main relaxation consisted of a visit to the salt lake, or a swim in the circular pool. The lake was by no means easy to find, since it was almost completely surrounded by palm trees, and on several occasions we drove straight past the depression. It was situated about three miles away from our camp, and in order to reach it we were obliged to wend our way through the palm trees and round the occasional mud buildings startling the goats and chickens with our unexpected appearances, until the ground became less fertile and more hummocky and open. The sloping banks of the lake were white with crystalline salt, while the water itself was similar to the Dead Sea, being very harsh to the mucous membranes, and of a density that made it impossible to swim with any ease. Here, lying in the shade of the trees, we would munch away at the dates, reading whatever book we had brought along, and rejoicing in our escape from the maddening flies. In the late afternoon we would return to camp in time for the cool grub up, and with the unhappy realisation that another night of fitful wakefulness lay ahead of us. One afternoon we toured the neighbouring oases to select a winter quarters in the neighbourhood. Oh, sorry, no, I skipped a line. To select a campsite, for David had informed us that we were to make our winter quarters in the neighbourhood. So away we went, bumping over the soft, hummocky ground that separated one clear-cut palm-fringed oasis from the next. The sharp definition between desert and f f bleh, I really can't read, and fertile cultivation was quite remarkable. We passed straight from the white glare of the one into the green shadow of the other. Each little oasis had its group of families, its farms of dates, olives and maize. Each had its headman, who was responsible t to the main oasis, for the maintenance of order and discipline. At each one we found a deep well, with walls built of palm wood, whose contents would be drawn up by using a dried goatskin as a container. We tasted the water and found it as cold as a mountain stream, and beautifully fresh. Sometimes the natives had formed little irrigation channels leading away from the wells, and these would flood yeah, and these would flood during the day, and so managed to keep the land fertile. Then another of their pe peculiarities was the manner in which scarecrows were constructed. These were made from dried asses' skins, and could be seen, propped up on a pole, in a good number of the plots. The wildlife of Kufra was quite considerable, but why a bird should be frightened by a stationary ass was a point that defeated me completely. 
Soon afterwards, we left for base in the old trustworthy Bombays. That's a uh, type of plane. Striking east to Wadi Halfa, where we refuelled, and then flying northwards, following the sinuous course of the Rhine. <laughs> One that's sinuous, too. That's Nile, not Ryle. Uh, until we had reached the Australian squadron's airport at Halwan. Halwan? Halwan? Hello, Juan. God, I get distracted. Here we landed and were entertained most generously. Well, said David, looking round at the Australians, thank you so much for all the help you chaps have given us, especially you, Ginger, he, uh, he added, turning to Shaw. Now that you have got to know us so well, you simply must come with us on our next raid. What? exclaimed Ginger in that very genuine way of his. What? Come on the next raid? Not likely. Poor old Digger Shaw. As it happened, he was killed in an aircraft accident soon afterward, but he only lost his life because he was trying to pull someone else out of the blazing plane. And, for my part, I shall never forget the way he came to my aid on that hot September morning about forty miles south of the rendezvous, when death it yeah, death itself when death itself had seemed to elbow its way in and keep us quiet company. Shall I go for another chapter? I don't feel like I can't, but also I mean am I just gonna keep recording till I finish the book? We shall see. I may not even put this anywhere. That's a lie. I'm pretty sure I will. Well, probably just in the chat, but hey. Chapter 19. Life in the Sand Sea. There is silence where hath been no sound. There is a silence where no sound may be. In the cold grave, under the deep, deep sea, or in the wide desert where no life is found. Sonnet. Silence. Thomas Hood. That definitely sounds like a villain name. I mean, the hood was uh, the bad guy in the Thunderbirds. Uh, Thomas Hood. I feel there's been a Thomas Hood somewhere. My screen has turned... Okay, no. My computer's been crashing a lot recently. I was worried that it had crashed and all the recording was gone. Which would be no great loss. But, no, it's just normal my screen saying... I don't want to be on any longer. Goodbye. <clears throat> Although we, that is to say, A Squadron, or Paddy Main Squadron, set up our winter quarters in one of the uh, in the Kufra, yeah, one of the Kufra oases, a complete little camp with its own reed huts, quartermaster's stores, and even a miniature officer's mess, our advanced headquarters was situated in the heart of the Sand Sea. This locality had been chosen because it was practically inaccessible to the enemy. Indeed, it was hard enough for us to drive up the narrow spit of comparatively firm sand from the south, and we knew that it would be a great deal harder for the enemy to try and approach through the softer sand to the north. It was said, too, that no planes flew over the sand sea, that a forced landing in such a lifeless waste meant almost certain death for its occupants. Whether there was any truth in this I would not care to say but certainly we were never troubled by aircraft. I, however, am now troubled by the fact that reading out loud dries out your mouth quite a lot, and I don't drink enough as it is. So I am going to drag a, a drag a grimp. Bloody hell, what's a grimp, and why would I drag one? Grab a drink. Uh, I will... Oh. Worrying. Um, I will pause this recording so you don't have to just wait for me to go to the kitchen. Audacity is on the other monitor. Wonderful. I mean, it's going to be a bit of a wait anyway, apparently. I hope you like waiting in your lovely reading videos. Oh, is this going again? There we go. I'd be quite interested to find out which silly sausage keeps leaving all the kitchen lights on. I'd also be interested to find out why everyone who cycles into uni seems to miss the big, massive, obvious this half of the path is for cyclists and this half is for pedestrians symbol. But that complaint is for another time. 
Where was I? I mean, I could probably get away with not even reading at this point, because I doubt anyone has listened to this uh, up to this point. Uh, but a ba -ba. Ah, here. It was here, then, that we lived throughout October and November, and during these months patrols were driving up north to attack the railway line with persistent regularity. Our dwelling place was clean and very isolated, for we were tucked away in a deep hollow, and all around the tumbling sand dunes encompassed us about. The soft beauty of their symmetrical curves, and the sinuous outlines, accentuated as they were at morning and evening by the glancing rays of the sun, provided an artistry one could not readily forget, and I shall long remember the delicate rosy flush, reflected for a moment from the smooth sand surfaces. God, you cannot read this quickly. As the radiance of the sunset dwindled and died like a funeral pyre, frequently in the evenings I would climb up, climb, climb up the steep, moulded slopes, my feet sinking deeply with each step I took. Oh, God, that's getting close to the mic. I'm getting worse as time goes on. I should have stopped before this chapter, but I've started it now, so I shall continue until I had reached a summit from which I could watch the colours live and tremble and die. The solitude was most impressive, and for the sight of the crested dunes mounting one behind the other as far as the eye could see, conveyed a sense of restful eternity. It was beautiful to watch the lines grow more distinct as the sun drew low in the sky, to see the shadows falling down the slopes and filling the smooth hollows below, the effect of continual change the gradual creeping movement of light and darkness. As I walked over the even slopes, leaving my footprints behind me and noting the geometrical positions of the wind there, I apologise for my inability to read, and noting the geometrical precision of the little wind-blown wrinkles and wavelets. Oh, it's a wavelet. I found myself wondering if I was the first person to trace his mark across this particular piece of ground and considering the possibility that nobody would follow in my footsteps until the world had come to an end. How quiet it was! The mind had soon put aside the war and realities to embark upon its own flights of fancy. In the Sand Sea we were about 180 miles south of the coast at Tobruk, and our patrols would allow two or three days in which to approach their targets. Jim Chambers had already received... yeah, had already only recently returned... Where did I get already from? It's not even on the page. Jim, P yeah. Jim Chambers only recently returned from a raid when I arrived at the rendezvous, and I was struck immediately by the change in him. He was suffering from very bad desert sores, not of the usual type, but deeply ulcerating and heavily infected, and with this complaint he had lost all his usual boyish enthusiasm and cheerful vigour. He was plainly unwell, you could tell that, by the lassitude and apathy which dogged him. He was depressed, too, about his raid, because he had not been able to confirm the results. He described to me how they had buried the charges beneath the track and then waited nearby to watch the next train blow up. When, however, a locomotive did come puffing along the line, nothing happened. The train receded into the distance. They decided that it was due to the dampness of the soil for the weather had been very bad in the coastal belt, and the boggy nature of the ground had made their progress difficult. Reminds me, um, later on in the war, in, uh, you, you, there. Can't even say Europe at this point, Christ. Um, there was a, a device that trains used, um, in the fog, that you'd attach it to the rail, and it had, like, a small explosive in it, just so you run over it and it makes a loud bang, and it was so the uh, train drivers would know, oh, I need to stop now, because there's something up ahead, but I won't be able to see it because of poor visibility, or whatever. And so uh, the SAS, or it might have been designed by someone else, so they did design lots of their own things, um, essentially took this device and put a little more explosive in it. So the train would come over the line and completely derail and explode and 
I think it was mainly when they blew up the railings, the uh, train drivers would usually see, oh, the railing is gone, I'm going to stop now, and it would be replaced very quickly. But doing it this way, it would derail a train and cause lots more wreckage, so it was took a lot longer to fix. I doubt anyone finds these asides interesting, because I think I'm the only one in this chat that actually has an interest in military history. But anywho... So they laid another charge using a different technique, but even as they were thus employed, an, en yeah, an enemy party detected them and attacked. In the melee that ensued, Silito, their navigator, was lost. Fortunately, however, there was a happy conclusion to the story, for Silito himself trudged into the rendezvous, footsore and weary, some eight days later, and this was the tale he had to tell. When, quite suddenly, he had found himself completely alone in the vicinity of Tobruk, he squatted down for a minute to reckon out what his next move should be. He had neither food nor water, only a compass and a revolver. He considered what he should do. He could march northwards and give himself up to the enemy. He could start heading east towards Alamein, keeping well within the coastal belt, where the Arabs might help him, where an occasional burr would provide him with water and where derelict trucks and lorries may well contain something in the way of necessities. Or finally he could walk due south, away from the line of the co no, away from the life of the coastal belt, through the arid desert where there was no next to no chance of meeting any form of life or water, and where a mistaken direction meant a certain and unpleasant death. It was the final alternative that he chose, a lonely march of nearly two hundred miles towards that little hollow, in the middle of the sand sea which we had chosen for our rendezvous. I must say, when it's phrased like that, that really doesn't seem like the best idea. I mean, I can understand not wanting to surrender, but to go back to friendly lines? Um, that sounds like a good plan. Not 200 miles through the desert. Anywho, I've been saying that a lot, that's worrying. I should stick to using real words. How did silly fake words get into my vocabulary? I shall have to find out and hit whoever is responsible. Probably myself. I should just save myself the trouble and hit myself now. Uh, da -da -ba Off he set, trudging steadily southwards and apparently not worrying much about the distance at first. On account of the recent rains, he was able to drink from the puddles whenever he felt thirsty, but as he progressed the ground became dry and more stony, and it was imperative for him to make each mouthful of water last. The skies became pitilessly blue and unchanging. He took to resting during the real heat of the day, continuing with his march only when it had grown cooler and when the glare of and shudder of the skyline had disappeared. Imagine the loneliness of this! day after day with the sun arching o up over him, without a soul to whom he could voice his thoughts, with a flat landscape that stretched on and on in front of him, with no indication of his whereabouts nor how far he had travelled, just the day and night to show how time was passing, and the conviction that he was correct in his com compass course to give him encouragement. On the second day the water gave out, and from then on he stored his urine in this is not going to be a pleasant story. And from then on he stored his urine in an old bully beef tin that he had found lying on the ground. But, he said, the urine became more and more concentrated. The contents of the tin he threw away, for the bully beef was too hard to masticate. It formed a sticky bolus in the mouth which was hard to swallow. To lie down and rest could not have been an easy decision, for it must have seemed that an hour without advancement was an hour wasted yet it was the only logical way by which he could reach his goal. The fourth day passed, then the fifth, and his progress began to slow down. His feet were sore, cut and blistered. It became a question of determination and staying power. He continued on his course, a lone figure trudging for mile after barren mile across the vast emptiness of the desert. On the sixth day he saw some dots on the skyline. Can the reader imagine his feelings when he saw that they were moving? The answer is no, I can't. Um, perhaps if I put a bit more time into it, but uh, I don't know, that's quite some relief. Or, or would you trust it? 
Oh, that leads on to the next sentence. Were they real? He wondered. Was this a trick of the eyes? Was it the heat haze? No, they actually were vehicles. They were coming towards him. On their present bearing they would pass by him a little to the west. Yes, they were jeeps. He could see them quite clearly now. He could make out the machine gun mountings. Almost beside himself with joy, he waved and waved and tried to shout. But they were going on as if they had not seen him. Surely that was not possible. Suddenly an idea occurred to him, and tearing off his shirt he rummaged in his pockets uh, and found some matches. In a moment he had set fire to his shirt and was waving it slowly backwards and forwards over his head. It burned with a smouldering flame, and the smoke faded readily on the hot air. With something akin to despair, he watched the jeeps drive past. They became distorted shapes in the heat haze. Then they were dots, and then he had vanished completely. He was alone once more with the heat, the sweat, and his thoughts. He turned and went on. It was on the eighth day that first he sighted the white-pointed slopes of the sand sea as it lay sprawled out in front of him, extending about a hundred miles to the east and west. Somewhere along this northern border there might be a few jeeps which were preparing to go out on a raid, or had just returned from one. He was dependent upon his own navigational judgement, and the entrance and exit tracks of the vehicles for finding the exact location, and if the jeeps were not there he would be forced to cross another forty miles of soft, sinking sand dunes before he reached the advanced rendezvous. It is doubtful whether he could have achieved this extra march, but luckily it was not necessary, as he found the tracks and soon afterwards came upon a small patrol. In this, fortune was with him, for the men would have left on the previous day had not one of the jeeps broken down and their departure been thus delayed. There's actually um, a picture of him just after this march. I mean, I imagine it wouldn't have been, oh, hooray, we found someone, let's all take a picture before we help. But it is very much of someone who is bedraggled somewhat. And so I imagine it would have been not too long after, but I don't believe there is a copy of that picture in this book. And either way, you can't see it, because this is not a video. Or perhaps it is, maybe I'll hunt it down. That sounds like too much work, I won't do it. Um, soon after his arrival, he was sent back to Kufra, and thence to base for some leave. His feet were being dressed daily, and even when he had been with, with us for a week, he still found it painful to hobble about. But that was all he had to show for his experience that and a hesitancy of manner and expression in the eyes that told their own story of mental strain and physical hardship. I hope I do not exaggerate or overemphasise the various points of this story, yet I think it would be difficult to do so, for I can remember one brief hour when I had foolishly lost myself, that dreadful feeling, like a shocking stab at the heart, when all of a sudden I realised that I had no idea where anybody else was. It seemed like a long while that I searched for the rendezvous on that occasion, realising, as I did so, that each step I took might be leading me away from the others. Speaking of exaggeration and overemphasising, um, at the start, when their raids were incredibly successful, because they were very far behind the enemy lines, and the enemy thought, well, why do we need to guard our airfields? No one will possibly get to them. And so they were destroying masses of planes, but they realised that um, Top Brass would probably think, oh, they're exaggerating, it's not that many. And so they always reported um, two-thirds of what they actually destroyed. And so when reconnaissance planes came over and um, reported back the damage, it was always, oh wow, that's even more than we thought. But uh, I am not in a comfortable position to reach my drink, and uh, this is not a bookmark it will have to do. And also my headset is broken, which makes this whole process even more inconvenient, but hey. I need to find somewhere that sells electrical tape, that should do it. As it turns out, 
Southern tape is not quite strong enough to keep headset together for more than a few days. <sighs> Back to well, this isn't a comfortable position. It's more comfortable there. I find there is no comfortable position to read whilst lying down, but I can't sit still long enough to try and record this while sitting up properly. Um, here. I was worried about Jim Chambers. His sores were not responding to treatment, and I was glad when I heard that a convoy was soon returning to Kufra, for the Sand Sea was no place for him in his present condition. Indeed, it was hard to realise that this was the Jim Chambers who had encouraged his men on from one effort to another as they brought their lorries through the long patches of soft sand, or that this was he who had been only too happy to drive up and give the answering fire at the Benghazi ambush in order that the others might withdraw. "'You know, Doc,' he said one evening, "'I can't make it out at all, but I don't seem to have the same keenness or enthusiasm these days.' It's not like the old times, when it was such terrific fun digging out the trucks, swearing away and ragging like hell all the time. Didn't you reckon that was good sport? Sometimes, I nodded. We were sitting at the foot of a huge dune that rose steeply above us in the darkness. It was some time since we had had our cocoa, and soon we would be tucking ourselves up in our blankets and wriggling into a groove in the soft sand. Most of the men had already gone to bed, but we could still hear the mumbles of some voices. Now, Jim was saying, all that enjoyment seems to have gone. Now it's just so much hard work. Well, damn it all, man, I replied em emphatically. You're not up to the mark to start off with. No, I suppose not. Don't you worry. Soon you'll be in the mess at camp. There'll be Eric Parton and Bobby Dodds and Corporal Leach to s see that you put away more grub than you can cope with. Why, you'll be as fit as a flea and hopping all over the place. But he was not very convinced, and I knew why. Like quite a number of soldiers, he hated going sick and being sent to base on medical grounds. His conscience troubled him, and he wondered if he was letting the squadron down. He was worried, too, that his health should give away like this, that he was not desert-worthy, and he was terribly anxious to return to us as soon as possible. I wish I'd done something really good before going away, he remarked after a pause. Just something to prove myself, you know? Not that I want any gongs or anything like that, but just for the mental satisfaction of the thing. Now, don't you be silly, Jim. This, this last raid of yours was all right? Well, maybe, but we didn't have any definite proof. I suppose the trouble is that you start getting depressed when you compare yourself with people like Jock Lewis or Paddy or Sergeant Armands. You see, there's such the hell of a, st a standard to live up to, isn't there? Look at Jock Lewis and the name he's got in the unit. He never earned any official sort of recognition, but just you listen to some of the men talking about him. Anyone would think he was a sort of god. His influence has lasted on in, in this unit, all right. If it hadn't been for him... None of us would be here now. It was rather strange looking at the matter in that light, and I wondered that... Sorry, I'm quite distracted. I'm trying to think. This is Jim Chambers. Um, yeah, Jim Armands is the other Jim I'm thinking of. Gentleman Jim. Uh, where was that? There. It was rather strange looking at the matter in that light. And I wondered what Jock Lewis would have thought if he could have seen us here. For as Jim had said, it was entirely due to his training of the unit, the way he had led the early marches on a water bottle a day, a water bottle a day, the lying up in the sun, the night attacks on dummy objectives. It was entirely through his preparations that we had reached our present position. David had been the man with the ideas, while Jock Lewis and Paddy were those whose efforts had helped to make them practicable and, use and successful. They had worked in a sort of mutual symbiosis, and here we were now, Paddy with his own squadron in operation and reports being wirelessed back to base. Railway line destroyed at blank station. I don't know if some of this is still censored or it's just generally 
such and such station. Offices and sidings blown up, or road mined at blank, telegraph lines demolished. It had been the growth of a unit. Well, I said finally, I know you haven't got anything to worry about, Jim, and I know the men think the same. At that he grinned rather sheepishly, and soon afterwards we had both retired to bed and fallen asleep. He was off the next morning, and we stood round the lorry while they loaded it up with rations and stores. We passed away the time of waiting with the usual flippant phrases, and it was not long before the men were ready and the driver had started up the engine. OK, Miller? Ready to go? Jim was standing in that characteristic way of his, with feet apart and hands on hips. OK, sir. Good. And he turned round to us. Well, so long, boys. Goodbye, Paddy. He put out his hand and then looked ruefully down at the bandages and shook his head. I've got all your Christmas mail. Bye, Sandy. I'll remember those books. Cheerio, Doc. I won't forget your films. He forced a little smile. Don't worry. I'll be back soon. I'll, I'll soon be back. Goodbye, Jim, we said. He clambered up painfully and nodded to the driver. We could see him waving to us as the lorry grew smaller and smaller, until at last it had become just an ungainly smudge against the vast expanse of sand. It was several weeks later, almost Christmas in fact, when we heard the news that he had died in hospital as a result of the... Oh, fucking hell. Diphtheritic infection of his sores. Such a tender moment, and they just throw in a word that I have no idea how to even attempt to say, and I somewhat ruin the moment. It's odd, I've read... This is the fourth book on... Well, I say the same subject, roughly the same subject. And there, there's the some names that show up everywhere, and there's some that show up very rarely at all, and I think that's... Really, the joy of people's memoirs is... I mean, in the history, you get all the big names. David Sterling, Paddy Main, Jock Lewis. But then... Bill Cumper, Jim Chambers. These are the stories that people you really somehow get to know over the course of this book. Never heard their names before in any of the others I read. And, um... The other thing is... Because each writer is only writing, say, about the men that they knew, so... Um, and he was talking about Captain McLean a decent amount, and he has an incredibly interesting life story. Although, in this book, he's only ever been re uh, referred to as Captain McLean maybe three times, and there's uh, people like Reg Seekings, Chris O'Dowd... I mean, I guess they weren't the biggest of names, but... I mean, they're names that you definitely hear when you look into the uh, SAS in the war, and they've not been mentioned at all. And although it seems like I'm suddenly thinking this stuff on the spot, I had a long think about this on my walk back from campus today. I don't know why, but it seems relevant, so I've started saying it now. Chapter 20. The Storytellers. Telling a tale not to imp importunate. Is that even a word? That's not a word I know. Telling a tale not too importunate to those who in the sleepy region stay, lulled by the singer of an empty day. William Morris. The days at the San Sea Rendezvous passed pleasantly enough. There were long lazy days with nothing much to do except to talk, re-eat and eat. Sick parades were brief affairs. We were not short of food or water. The company was good. We lacked nothing. Paddy had enlisted several newcomers into the squadron of which Bill Fraser was second in command. Harry Pote, who quickly grew an attractive Santa Claus beard. Johnny Wiseman, who on occasions would give us lessons in European history. Sandy Wilson, young and eager. Burnerville Clay, the incurable optim optimist. McDermott, a fair-headed North Irishman and MacDonald, a Scot, were amongst their number. Mike Sadler, who was a navigator come operative, now boasted two pips, while Sandy Scratchley held a sort of roving commission with us. These, then, were the officers of our squadron, although there were, 
There would always be a number of them out on raids at any particular time. The other ranks, too, were very happy here, enjoying their periods of rest in between the raids. Sergeant Rose had now become the squadron sergeant major, and a fine job he made of it. As for Sergeant Bennett, I shall never forget the horror in his voice when I suggested that he would be just the man to look after the sanitation side of things for the squadron. I ran out of breath there. It had become obvious that the number of flies in the camp were on the increase, so we shifted our rendezvous area to another position about five miles away and settled ourselves down to a strict regime in field hygiene. It was at this juncture that I had voiced my opinion concerning, concerning Sergeant Bennett's capabilities. Sanitation? What? Me, sir? He laughed mirthlessly. Why, I don't even know what the difference between a fly trap and, uh, uh, well, a refuse pit, he finished lamely. Then, Sergeant Bennett, this is just your chance to find out. It isn't often we get the opportunity of being paid to learn something fresh. You should seize it gladly and with both hands. Well, what do you make of that? We could hear his indignant tones a few minutes later as he walked it over with some of his sympathetic mates. Sanitation, I ask you. Who'd have thought I'd have dropped to that? However, we soon had him busy, and he certainly did appear to take an interest in the work, although you never could tell for certain, as he was uh, as he was such a perfect actor. One minute he would be looking so worried, with a deep frown on his forehead, and the next he would be laughing away as if he had never known a care in the world. Between us we started to construct a fly trap, and soon the idea had caught on amongst the men with the result that all sorts of quaint variations of the original model of the uh, trap, fly, pattern, field, might have been seen decorating the sunlit slopes of the sand dunes. Sergeant Bennett had his own specialty, with a little bit of treacle inside. Downs and Adamson, two of our operatives, were busy putting their theories with sardines into practice, and eventually we had about a dozen fly traps decorating our camp area. But if ever flies had been known to take a hearty dislike to a nice tasty piece of rotting sardine, sardine, bloody hell, or a lovely sticky bit of jam, then this was the occasion. They shunned those traps as if each one had contained a spider instead of some tempting morsel. Sergeant Bennett shook his head in perplexity while he sat watching his trap and giving a running commentary on the progress made. One fly's landed on the outside. Are you going to walk in now? Yes, definitely is. He can smell the jam, that's what it is. Go in, walk in, you silly. Ah, I see what it is. He doesn't know where the entrance is. That's what it is, definitely. Reminds me of Thompson and Thompson. Then there would be a brooding silence for a minute or two as events moved to an ominous climax in Sergeant Bennett's direction until finally the sound of a vicious swipe with a fly swat told us that another little drama had just been concluded. If you were near enough, you might hear his angry mutterings. That's the way in. I've even forgotten the voice already. That's the way in. There, see? You silly little. And then he would settle down once more and resume his vigil for the next unwary fly. In this way, an amateur fly trap competition sprang up, although, needless to say... Our fly swats claimed to many more victims than all the traps put together. Then, too, one was confess confessed to the very childish but amusing folly of placing little odds. Yeah, thought they were betting. Placing little odds and ends of dismembered flies in Sergeant Bennett's trap when he wasn't looking, and then accusing him of cheating when we came to add up at the end of the day. That expression of righteous indignation which came upon his countenance and the grievous hurt in the tones of his voice as he disclaimed any knowledge whatsoever of such, yeah, of such and such a mangled fly, were perfect representations of injured innocence. Yet there was far more common sense in his make-up than you might at first ex suspect, for he was one of our oldest operatives, and you could bet your bottom dollar that he would not still, that he would not still have been with. I honestly can't get past this sentence he says after only two attempts. But he was one of our oldest operatives, and you could bet your bottom dollar that he would not still have been with the unit if he had not been a pretty uh, if he had not had a pretty good head on his shoulders. In fact, 
I have just dropped the book, and am struggling to pick it up. In fact, he had been on so many raids, one way and another, that he tended to get his details mixed up when he came to tell you about them afterwards. This always struck me as a being strange, for when your life is in danger you do not, as a rule, forget about the incidents afterwards. Rather, the converse holds true. But Sergeant Bennett would start off. Oh yes, I remember. Yeah, I remember, sir. That was on the Tammet job. Now, wait a minute. No, it was at Mercer Brager. Definitely. Yes, that's right. Mercer Brager. Well, we was walking along the track. It was pitch black, mind you. No stars or nothing. And Mr. Sterling says as how we ought to separate into two patrols of two men each. So we did as he said, and away he went with Sergeant Ma Major Riley. Well, we were going along the road when suddenly we hears voices over on the right. Or was it the left now? Anyway, it doesn't matter much, but we think that's pretty funny, hearing voices, I mean. And we reckoned we'd better find out about them. So we crouched down and stalked over. Lily and me was together. No, let me see, it wasn't Lily. It was Kershaw. Lily had been with me on the job before. Or was it Phillips? Oh, I forget now. But anyhow, we was creeping along when Kershaw whispers over to me that there was some chaps behind us. Behind, mind you. So I says, are you sure? And he says, definitely he is. Well, for the next quarter of an hour, we go stalking round and round to try and get behind them, see? And find out who they are. Then, all of a sudden, a voice comes out of the darkness. Is that Sergeant Bennett? So I says, definitely it is. And he says, well, this is Sergeant Major Riley, blast ya. Oh dear, was Major Sterling wild? Because our two patrols have been stalking each other round an enemy airfield, you see. <laughs> oh god. Makes you laugh, don't it? Oh yes, it does, I just did. But we weren't laughing then, I can tell you. Never felt such fools in our lives. I think it was the Mercer Brager job. In the good old days of peace, Sergeant Bennett told me he used to live at Oxford. Oh, I didn't do much of an Oxford voice. And, ooh, a message I hear. You can't hear that, I shouldn't mention it. <clears throat> and from what I can make out, he lived to one thing alone, the student's rags. It appeared that there were a number of policemen at Oxford who seemed to have got it into their silly chumps that Sergeant Bennett, of all people, was the sort of chap who would do such a foolish thing as to kick a copper up the backside while he wasn't looking and then leg it fast. As if Sergeant Bennett would ever dream of doing anything like that. The fact that you could be put in... I, I don't understand their words sometimes. The 40s were a different time. The fact that you could be put in jug on so remote a suspicion just went to show how little truth there was in all this talk about liberty. Liberty, indeed. Why, the very word was foreign, wasn't it? Ah, but the student's rags. A, a smile of happy reminiscence lit up the usual rather sad expression on Sergeant Bennett's features. The student's rags. You could get a bit of your own back on the cops then, all right. Nice little haul of Bobby's caps you could make if you went about it the right way. They didn't stand much chance of getting you in that crowd. Besides, have you ever seen a copper without his helmet? He don't look properly dressed like, does he? Sort of naked somewhere. Coppers don't half look embarrassed without their hats, you know. Oh yes, you could pay. Yeah, you could pay back a few old scores in those rags. Definitely, you could. For anyone who doesn't understand the English in that, he ran around with students stealing policemen's helmets. Ooh, my arm is not happy today. Ah oh, well, hopefully it'll be better tomorrow. I remember too his indignation when we were listening to the wireless one evening. We had ca we had a captured Italian set with us, and Sergeant Bennett had appointed himself to do the manipulating. I think it was some item after the news that was on at that time, and the suave voice of the announcer was speaking with patronising pride of the fine parachute boys in England. Why? He remarked as he described a recent visit to their camp. These lads were so tough that one of them had even played some tunes on his mouth organ as he parachuted down to earth. My god, I know this story. At once a look of ferocious indignation spread over Sergeant Bennett's lank features. 
Did you hear that? he cried aghast. Tough indeed. Why, we was playing mouth organs and things, taking photographs, making jokes and doing all sorts when we were parachuting two years ago. But we didn't have any nice little announcers to come along and say sweet things about us. Oh no, it's the lovely clean boys who sit on their backsides at home that get the write-ups. Why, they're so tough at home that they have to ask for comforts for the poor soldiers stuck out in the wilds of Yorkshire. The wilds of Yorkshire! You should have heard the anger in that voice. It would have made a... It would have made a... Tra a tra yeah, tragedian? I don't know, someone who plays tragedies, I suppose. Made a tragedy. I can't read it. I'm I'm bad. A tragedian jealous. All the blinking BBC can do is say how blinking tough they are at home. Well, I don't know what the world's coming to. It's deadly. That's what it is. Definitely deadly. And with a resigned shake of his head, he returned to his book once more. If you did not know Sergeant Bennett, you might have thought that he was deeply upset by these worldly injustices. But when you came to understand him better you realised that they were really his joy of living. And when, a moment or two later, you heard his merry laugh ringing out among the sand dunes as he chased after a battered old football, well, you could imagine just how much he must have enjoyed those rags at Oxford. It was blowing a sandstorm, and the white grit as it swept whistled and eddied round the trucks, sought out each one of us stinging and biting and blinding, Earlier in the morning, the breeze had played over the summits of the dunes, giving them accompanying wisps of fleecy white, so that they looked like snow-capped mountains, and the sand, falling with a soft hissing, had drawn sin sin I can't even remember what I decided was the correct pronunciation at this point, I'm too tired. Uh, but drawn sinuous patterns on the downward slopes. Then the breeze had become a crying wind, flinging up the grains with joyful gusts, so that the world became smaller and smaller, so that the jeeps and lorries disappeared from sight, and we were living in our little circle of dirty grey. We crawled under the tarpaulin that was slung over from one side of a lorry, leaning back against it and setting on the loose flaps to keep them in position. Every now and then a vicious flurry of sand whisked through a hidden gap in the canvas, and set us all blinking and rubbing our eyes. It was impossible to read, so we lay and talked, shading our faces with our hands when we heard the drive of the hissing sand coming towards us. "'Thank God we haven't got to travel in this,' muttered, muttered Sergeant Lily. "'It reminds me of the day we left to attack Burkadrome. We only managed to drive about forty miles, and the truck got so hot that we had to keep on changing our positions.' I looked across at him, with his curly black hair, and his dark eyes with the little furrows and wrinkles round them. I could not help wondering why he had taken up this form of life, for he was getting on for forty, and had a wife and family to, to look after at home. I suppose it must have been the individuality of the work that appealed to him. Certainly he had learned to depend upon himself right from the earliest days, and a result, as a result he had learned a straightforward and sound philosophy of life. Never hilarious and never downhearted, he always maintained a steady level of good humour, as if life could not spring any surprises on him. "'Did you have any luck on the raid?' I asked. "'Well, in a way, yes, and in a way, no, as you might say. "'The job was unsuccessful, because we didn't get anything. "'But on the other hand, we were mighty fortunate to get away. "'The LRDG took us there, cheap patrol it was, "'and they dropped us off about thirty miles east of Burka. "'There was four of us, all told. "'Major Main, he jerked his thumb in the direction of Paddy's jeep, "'and three of us corporals. I was a corporal then, you see, Doc. And each of us carried 24 bombs. I really should have done a voice for him. Each of us carried 24 bombs, some in our haversacks and some slung from our belts. Well, it seemed the devil of a long walk, that did. What with the darkness and our loads getting heavier and heavier all the time. It was hard work and no mistake. But by the next morning we had reached a little Arab camp. So we lay up all, all that day with the goats and the chickens. They smelt pretty high. Is that, like, the chickens and goats smelt like they were high? They smelt pretty high. Oh, it might just be like, oh, they smelt good, sarcastically. He grinned. You ever slept with chickens, Doc? I nodded. Good for you. Those wretched things just can't leave a chap alone. 
They were pecking and chirping round us the whole blasted time. Still, we were too tired to worry about them, and we slept like logs. That evening we had a good meal with the Arabs, but we pushed off early because we wanted to get to the Burqa airfield by midnight. I should mention it is shortening this to COS every time. Normally I would say because. I don't know why I feel the need to specify that. Uh, well, everything... Oh, that's too loud again. Well, everything went all right, and we was just getting on to the drone when, would you believe it, our blinking air force has to come over and raid the place. There was shrapnel and bombs flying about all over the place. Clink, clink, and swish, swish. And every now and then a terrific boom. That's a good boom. It's not boom, it's got a P on the end. By Joe, we make some hefty bombs, you know. I often wonder what the... Oh, that's itties, isn't it? I think that's... I wouldn't say racial slur. I don't think it's used as a derogatory term, but it's a uh, collective term for... Oh, it'll be the Italians, won't it, itties? I often wonder what the itties would have thought if they had found some of us dead on their airfield the next morning. Well, after a bit it got quiet. Um, I'm thinking and lost my place. And Major Main sent me off to put a bomb on the first plane. We could just see it in the darkness. So I started crawling along the ground, and I'd just got within about ten yards of it when suddenly a sentry shouted a challenge. Now, Major Main acts fast, you know, but I couldn't rightly say what happened next in this particular case. But I reckon he must have thrown a grenade as quick as a flash, because all I could see was a couple of Italians parting in mid-air. That gave the alarm, worse luck, and things began to get pretty hot, with the sentries firing at us from all sides of the drone. The stuff was whistling over our heads this way and that, and I can tell you we weren't feeling so good. It's quite an interesting way of doing it. When uh, Paddy Main gets challenged by a sentry, his first instinct is to kill the man, because um, oh, Paddy was a very violent man, often a violent drunk, it seemed. Um... When recruited, the common story is that he was in a prison um, because he uh, punched his officer in the face. But um, the stories of Fitzroy MacLean, when he was uh, behind enemy lines and challenged by sentries, he would shout at them in perfect Italian, and they'd be so worried that they'd done something wrong that they don't think, oh, why is this officer here in our airfield? It's just, oh god, quick. Make sure everything is right. This guy is yelling and I don't like it. There's some great stories of that. Um, a sudden gust of wind hit the tarpaulin, billowing it out like a sail, and passed on leaving us coughing and spitting out the dust. Sergeant Lilly wiped the back of his hand across his mouth and continued. As I say, it weren't too comfortable on that drome and we decided it was a good thing to get away while we could. They had our range more than once as we ducked and ran for it, so Major Main shouted out at us to split up into two groups and find some place to hide. I was with Corporal Parker, I remember. I'm now slipping into a voice. Mm. Which is a shame, because I can only do one voice for sergeants, and it's all based off Colour Sergeant Bourne from Zulu. I remember, and we... We managed to get through yeah, we managed to get through the guards and found a house with a decent sized garden which had a hedge running round it. We were only just in time though, because a minute later some lorries Lancy as they were, began rolling up to the house and unloading itty soldiers. From where we'd hidden ourselves in the hedge we could see them patrolling all around the place. Parker crawled over beside me and whispered that we ought to beat it. But I was too lazy. Just like I am now, Doc, you know. I don't get moving unless I have to. And I told him to go to sleep. As a matter of fact, I was so blinking tired that I dropped off straight away. And didn't wake up until soon after six o'clock when it was beginning to get light. I could see a couple of itty sentries talking their, heads, uh, talking their heads off a few yards away from where I was. And I suppose it was their voices that must have woken me up. I looked around for Corporal Parker, but he'd gone. We never saw him again. He paused a minute, licking the grit from his cracked lips before he went on. Well, this garden wasn't my idea of a health resort, as maybe you can guess. 
so I crawled over very quietly to where I reckoned Major Main would be hiding, but he'd gone too. It looked as if I was in a tight spot. I was hiding under a bush, you see, and from it I had a pretty good view of a couple of itty girls, not bad lookers either, walking round the garden with an Alsatian dog. I watched them as they came right past me, and you can guess that my heart was beating mighty fast. They came so close that if it had been some other time or some other place... Oh, well, what the hell, he rolled over... He rolled over and laughed. Uh, is that... implying... Oh, yes, it is. I'm too tired to pick up on that immediately. He rolled over and laughed. Still, I didn't have any time to let me mind wander, because darn me if that blasted Alsatian didn't find me. A friendly sort of cuss he was, and hard as I tried, I couldn't prevent him from licking my face. The girls stopped a little farther down the path, wondering what was the matter, and started calling to the animal. I gave him a smack on the nose that sent him away at a trot, and the girls gave him another smack when he got to them. God, everyone wants to hit the dog. Poor dog. So I reckon he caught it at both ends. Now I could see I was going to get nabbed if I stayed there any longer. There seemed to be nothing else to do, so I got out of the bush, stood up, and started to saunter off. You see, it would have been stupid to try and crawl away in the open. Well, I reckon that was the longest walk I've ever done. There were itties here and itties there. I seemed to be walking past them for the next five miles. I suppose they took me for a jerry or one of their own chaps, because I was only dressed in shorts and a shirt. After a while I reached the railway line, and there one Italian did stop me. Dark, swarthy little devil he was. I reckon he couldn't have been more than twenty. We were neither of us armed, but he started to make out that I was his prisoner and tried to force me to go back to the camp with him. Now, I don't like itties, Doc, and this chap was no exception, so I had to strangle him. Funny, killing a chap with your own hands, Doc. I can still see his white face and dark brown eyes quite clearly. His cap had toppled off in the struggle, so I put it back over his head to make him look more natural. Well, I left him lying there, sprawled out and looking up at the sun, and I pushed on as fast as I could till I came to an Arab camp. The Arabs gave me some food and hid me away in, in a corner of one of their tents, and I went to sleep. By Joe, there were plenty of fleas there, all right. You know, I reckon those Arabs get so used to fleas that they begin to think there's something the matter with them if they stop scratching for a while. I can't say rightly how long I slept there but it hardly seemed any time at all before the Arabs were shaking me and waking me up. They pointed out through an opening in the tent, and who should I see but Major Main and Corporal Storey walking back? By Joe, I felt a lot better for that. We all had a good bite of grub, and then we walked over to the rendezvous where we met the LRDG patrol, and that, Doc, was the end of that. Well, you were lucky, all right, I commented. Yes, in a way. Old Sergeant Lily would never commit himself. But we didn't do any damage, you see. Still, it wasn't so bad for an old un like me. I showed him I could still beat an itty when it came to the point. He gave a grunt of approval. That was the best part of that trip, I guess. Beside us, as he was speaking, the tarpaulin had been waving and flapping like a live thing, and all the time we could hear the sound of that steady, driving hiss outside. You enjoyed it, did you? I asked. It's all right now, Doc, to look back on, you know. But don't you prefer the successful raids? Yes, he thought for a moment, uncertain. Yes, I suppose so. There's that feeling of satisfaction. But they aren't so thrilling when you come to think about them afterwards. There was that time where Major, when Major Main's patrol got over 50 planes in one week. We've called that airfield Paddy's Own ever since then. You ask Sergeant Bennett, he'll tell you all about it. It's good now to think that the Italians were phoning and wirelessing to Benghazi and Tripoli, saying they were surrounded by overwhelming British forces and couldn't hold out much longer. There was only five of us there, you know. He smiled. Yes, and it was good lying outside the airfield and watching them firing off their flak, thinking they were being bombed as one plane after another blew up with a bang. You certainly feel you have done your job all right. Yes, I suppose those are the best raids. He lifted a flap of the tarpaulin and peered out. From where we were, we could see the flying sand turn to a murky smir smir swirling red by the lighting of the setting sun. Pity the poor sailors on a night like this, said Sergeant Lily as he crawled back to his place. 
I see that I have referred to the officers and sergeants, but have made little reference to the men, who were, of course, the core of the unit. The names come back to me as I write, and even now... And even now... I suddenly stop reading, and I can't tell why. And even now, in imagination, I can see their dark, tanned bodies, the rough, t tussled hair... Yeah, tussled hair and beards, can picture them lining up for their meal with clinking mess tins, and can almost hear their jokes and sallies being thrown around backwards and forwards. O'Dowd, Evans, Austin, Downs, Robinson, Miller, Cunningham, Shaw, and many others. They would be busy at work on the jeeps and lorries, looking after the maintenance, cleaning the guns and testing them out, checking up the stores and equipment and learning navigation, and the cooks little Paddy Allen, who was killed not long afterwards, and Hammond, who joined us from the RASC. Ooh. Royal Artillery? Something call? Cool. Um. There's a word beginning with an S that springs to mind, but I can't quite remember what it is. Uh, oh no, I'm thinking of culinary. Not quite beginning with an S. Um. Always seemed to have a full day as they did with. Always. Yeah. And Hammond, who joined us from the RASC, always seemed to have a full day as they did their utmost to disguise the bully in biscuits. Um. The bully they keep mentioning is, uh, bully beef. It's sort of a, um. canned meat that they were not overly fond of. Well, when they hadn't had food for a long time, they loved it, but. wasn't exactly living in the lap of luxury. Then there was Shotton, who had become the squadron's medical orderly. You could not have asked for a better man. Between us we had managed to get an Indian pattern ambulance as far as the Sand Sea. No mean feat, when all is considered, for they were not strongly constructed. This vehicle had been especially fitted with several gadgets inside, and consequently we took a little pride in its upkeep. We had felt that something of this nature was very necessary to the unit, but now that we had got it, there seemed to be very few casualties. Our most severe loss occurred when one of the returning patrols drove over some mines. One officer and three men were killed outright. Nevertheless, the ambulance was very useful as a resting place for anyone with a fever, and Robinson, I remember, took refuge there during his attack of otitis media. <coughs> oh, Christ. Once inside, they were sheltered from both sun and flies. <coughs> I feel I should be in the ambulance at this point. Moreover, a point I may as well emphasise, they were not disturbed by their friends. It is quite remarkable sometimes how callous soldiers are towards their friends. I can recall an occasion when I went into one of the wards of the underground hospital at Mersa Matra. The atmosphere was shocking. It was difficult to see the far end of the ward on account of the haze of cigarette smoke. There was the continuous noise and babble of men shouting out to one another, while, above the din, the wireless blared away and grated out its music. The man I had come to visit was dangerously ill from his wounds, too ill to be moved. Several other men were present whose condition was extremely grave. Their companions must have been aware of this, but they seemed to take no notice. If you had questioned one of them, he would probably have shaken his head, and with an impressive display of concern upon his features replied, Yes, I reckon that chap in the corner must be pretty bad. Just lies there and don't say nothing. It's that gas gangrene they talk about. That's what he's got, I believe. And the next minute he would be shouting out at the top of his voice if anyone wanted a Bakshi V cigarette. Quietness is seldom appreciated by a soldier until he is ill, and then he has not allowed it. That appears to be one of the circumstances that is bred of war. During this time in the Sand Sea, we blew up the Tabrik Matra railway line seven times. I will only mention two of these raids. The first was led by McDermott, who, with his patrol of three jeeps, drove up by night to the railway line and camped down near the station. His intention was to blow up the first train that halted there, but unfortunately the next goods train that came rattling along blew a loud blast on its whistle and went straight through. There was no further traffic on the line. The sky slowly lightened, 
and realising that there was no time to be lost, the patrol drove into the station. The Italians who were supposed to be on duty, and those who were and the, yeah, and those who were roughly awakened from their sleep, received a most unhappy surprise. No shots were fired, there seldom were on a successful raid. The shivering Romans, with their hands held high above their heads, being concerned only with their own immediate welfare. Two Germans, also, like good industrious early birds, were discovered at the top of a telegraph pole, busily engaged on mending the line. In this precarious position they found it hard to understand who these bearded people were on the ground below, but once they had done so, they showed a commendable speed in making their descent. All the prisoners were then herded together by one man, while the rest worked fast placing the bombs, laying the fuses, and destroying the place systematically. One rather amusing incident occurred when a charge had been laid. Apparently the fuse was very short and necessitated a fast withdrawal once it had been lighted. Consequently, a jeep with its engine running, was driven in p into position nearby, and as soon as the fuse had been lit, Corporal o O'Dowd, the man who had fired it, jumped onto the jeep and the driver promptly accelerated away. The driver, however, was just a little too prompt, and he moved off with such a jerk that O'Dowd was somersaulted off the back of the jeep. It was typical of the enemy that, whereas the German laughed heartily at this map, mishap, which, incidentally, resulted in no injury, the Italians were too occupied and cowering in sheer terror to be able to appreciate it. They do love to make fun of the Italians. And rightly so. Um, <laughs> there's a story of um, Dudley Clark, who was in charge of uh, deceptions. Um, he'd been told that we were attacking one place, and so he needed to get the enemy out of that place as much as possible. So the normal way of doing this he convinced the enemy that there'd be attack on a second place that I'm going to call place B. And so normally um, people we will be diverted from place A to shore up the defences at place B. And so it's then much easier to attack place A because there's less people there. However, when he tried this with the Italians, um, rather than taking men from place A to place B to defend it better, they completely withdrew from place B and had all their men in place A, because they thought place B was going to be attacked. Rather than defend it better, they just said, yeah, no, you can have it, we don't want to fight, and left, meaning there were twice the amount of people in the objective we actually wanted to attack. But anywho... Oh yeah, it's Corporal O'Dowd, he... um sadly died later at um, Termoli, which was essentially one of the worst battles the SAS had. There was a truck of, I think, 17 men that was destroyed and killed all of them at once. And I w won't go into more details of that, because that's generally not a happy story. The other raid did not really materialise, but Sandy Scratchley, who had been pinning for action... Oh, pining for action makes more sense. Was selected as a likely candidate to blow up an oil dump just behind the enemy's lines. That is to say, between Darbor and Alamein. This, naturally enough, was an extremely difficult target, if only on account of the numbers of enemy troops in the area. And I'm afraid we all had a bit of a laugh over it. Especially when Sandy, with his quaint humour and odd Damon Runyon expressions not entirely sure who Damon Runyon is, I should probably look that up, worked out a plan of jumping a train at Matra and riding the rods as far as Eldaba. Taken as a general rule, one may say that the more closely a target was situated to the enemy's fighting line, the harder it was to approach, so that it was with sincere wishes of good luck and godspeed that we saw Sandy jog away northwards one morning across the Sand Sea. I cannot say for certain what happened to him except to mention that, after a series of startling experiences, he discovered that he had penetrated our own as well as the enemy's lines. He was making good progress for his target, apparently, just when the 8th Army broke through the enemy's defences, and for the next few days he spent a lively time bobbing up and down behind pieces of camel thorn, while battles were waged around him, and while mixed forces swept past him on every side. 
but he looked just as cool and debonair when next I saw him in Shepherds. I mean, that doesn't say Shepherds, but I'm assuming it's just an archaic spelling or something. Well, it's a place name, so it could get distorted anyway. It was simply another story to him, and not a bad one at that. The 8th Army did not take long to advance from Alamein to Tobruk and beyond, and by that time our position in the Sand Sea had become valueless, for we were no longer behind the enemy's lines. It was obvious then that we should have to make a fresh rendezvous, and with this object in mind we began to pack up our stores and get ready to move. Well, that's three chapters I'll stop reading there, and I don't imagine I will record me finishing this book. So I shall tell as best I can the rest of the tale from memory. Um, there may have been other raids behind enemy lines, but the um, main thing was Dave Sterling was very eager to um, meet up with the Americans, who were... I guess there was kind of a very large pincer movement happening in North Africa at the time, when we broke through at El Alamein. And so, um, yeah, Dave Sterling wanted to meet up with the um, Americans through the German line, well, German-Italian lines. And so he organised a group to essentially just drive through the lines and get to where the Americans were. And they were stopped along the way. Um, I think they were most likely betrayed by uh, some of the Arabs. I mean, I say betrayed, that implies that they were on their side to begin with. Uh, some of the Arabs were very friendly to them, and some of the Arabs very much weren't. And I would be more specific than just Arabs, but I'm not 100% sure. And the book only goes as far as saying Arabs most of the time. So yeah, David Sterling, the founder of the SAS, was um, captured, and I think it was all but two of their group were captured... Um, but the other two, who I really should remember the names of but can't, might have been Johnny Cooper. Equally, I'm now no longer sure that's actually his name, because I realised how similar it is to Tommy Cooper, and I could well be getting that mixed up. Um, they made it to the American lines, and there was a reporter there who'd wanted to um, be there for when the Americans and British joined up. And um, so he reported the story of how these bedraggled men with... Um, so when they're in the desert, they're not shaving at all. They they become, I guess, sort of like stereotypical um, homeless people, honestly, in the way that they look and are dressed. And so um, that's a worrying light from my screen. I hope that's not what I think it is. And um, so, yeah, the Americans didn't actually believe that they were real soldiers for a long time. And so after this harrowing journey they'd had, they were then taken as prisoners of war. Um, but yeah, then the war in North Africa finished as the Italians capitulated. Well, no, they withdrew. They capitulated when we went into Sicily. Yeah, but at that point... Um, because it didn't seem like the SAS had a future, the author, Malcolm Playdell, um, he switched to um, a hospital. I think it was in North Africa, or possibly somewhere else. But he, he wasn't with the SAS for the rest of the war. And then they were split into uh, the Special Boat Service and the Special Raiding Squadron for a bit. And then they had some awful missions in Italy. And then they were reformed as the SAS for the war in Europe. And it was actually the SAS who liberated Belsen. A man named John Tonkin. So this is where I check on the computer. Only to find out it has stopped recording a long time ago and presumably crashed. Oh my lord, it's still running. I guess both screens time out. That's odd. I've never seen one of them do that before. Uh, ba -ba -ba. 
so yeah, that's been me reading for an hour and 40 minutes, Jesus Christ. Enjoy. Well, no, you'd have done that bit already. Well, I doubt you would actually enjoy it, but uh, whatever I'm rambling, let's just end this.